Peterson. I'm the acting director this year of the Center of Islamic Studies and um, I'm delighted to, to welcome you to this, our first seminar uh, in, in the series of public talks uh, this term and indeed this year. We've really got a great selection uh, of, of speakers and researchers uh, this term and we're going to be broadcasting more or less every two weeks at this time, 5.15. And um, I'm particularly delighted uh, that we can start the, the year with um, Dr. Alice Wilson. Uh, she'll be um, uh, starting our series this term. And Dr. Wilson is a, a great friend of the Center of Islamic Studies. She's a social anthropologist and senior lecturer at the University of Sussex. And she previously held postdoctoral fellowships at both um, Durham and Cambridge universities. And Dr. Wilson's first book, Sovereignty in Exile, A Saharan Liberation Movement Governs, was published in 2016 with the University of Pennsylvania Press. And this is really a, great, a groundbreaking ethnography of, uh, of statehood and sovereignty. It looks at the Western Saharan liberation movement and tells a story really of the Western Sahara's ongoing um, uh, battle for sovereignty and how the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic went about building a state when it was in exile in refugee camps in Algeria. Dr. Wilson suggests that these refugee camps are not politically stagnant places. They're actually full of political life, if you know how to look for it. There is indeed a state, or at least a state movement in the camps. And she tracks masterfully the way that even as the state becomes a bureaucratic project, the revolution still endures. So this is really a, a, a very well-regarded contribution to the anthropology of states and sovereignty. And Dr. Wilson has also published widely in leading international journals on elections, on the Arab Spring, on refugee camps, on political legitimacy, uh, and on revolution and revolutionary values. Now, after studying the Western Sahara, Dr. Wilson uh, moved her focus to Oman, and uh, she'll be talking to us today about her research there. And um, just before I, I ask her to start, uh, we will um, have a short break of no more than five minutes after the end of the presentation. And that's the time that I would invite you, if you have questions, uh, to type them in the chat function uh, in that time. Or you can do so when the, the Q&A session starts. And you can also, if you want, raise your electronic hand using the electronic button on your screen. Um, so we will be recording the presentation, not the question and answer session, but we will be recording the presentation. Uh, but in the meantime, I would ask everyone to keep themselves uh, muted so that it's, the technology works uh, for everyone. So Alice, welcome and uh, thank you and over to you. Thank you so very much, Paul, for this very warm welcome and very kind introduction. And thank you also to Neil at the Centre for Islamic Studies for your help in setting up all the technology for today. It's an especially great pleasure for me to give this talk at the Centre for Islamic Studies at Cambridge. Because the Centre and the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies in Cambridge supported the formative stages of this research. FAMES supported my application to the Cambridge Humanities Research Grants for the very first fieldwork towards this project back in 2013. And I was able to undertake that fieldwork around my participation in the Center of Islamic Studies visit to Sharjah, in which I took part in 2013. Uh, so um, thank you for that early support and thank you for this great opportunity uh, to come back and receive feedback on this work in progress. And I especially welcome feedback from colleagues from Oman. Your expertise on the questions I'm addressing is extremely welcome and I look forward to your comments. So the question that I bring to you today and that lies at the heart of my current research is, what happens to ideas, people, and the connections between them after the defeat of revolution. When people were revolutionaries in their past, what happens to them and their ideas when they're living as the defeated subjects of the governing authority that they once opposed? If that governing authority does not allow them to form a political opposition or a veterans organization and imposes an official silence on the revolutionary past, do the networks, 
ideas and values of defeated revolution simply disappear. When it comes to what post-conflict authoritarian states with enough resources would like to see happen, we have some fairly familiar answers to this question. When post-conflict authoritarian states have the resources available, as is the case for the Sultanate of Oman and other Gulf Cooperation Council monarchies, these kinds of states have relied heavily on patronage, the distribution of resources along lines of political hierarchy, and repression as two strategies to quell dissent. Gulf monarchies relied heavily on these tactics in facing the Arab Spring. In March 2011, in the early days of the protests which affected principally Bahrain and Oman, the GCC countries agreed to provide a 10-year Marshall Plan style package worth 20 US billion dollars to Bahrain and Oman. Alongside this patronage, we also see repression. There have been arrests of dissidents in Bahrain, Oman and other GCC states. The Sultanate of Oman, the focus of my talk today, also relied on both patronage and repression in facing the insurgency by revolutionaries in Dofar from 1965 to 1975. Let me briefly introduce the Far and its war before I address questions of the Omani states and its allies' deployment of patronage and repression to quell the, Dof the Dofar revolution. The Far is pictured here. It's the southern governorate of the Sultanate of Oman. It was once famous in the ancient world as a major source of frankincense. The Far is the largest of Oman's governorates it's similar in size to Hungary or South Korea. In 2010, the FARD was home to some 250,000 Omanis and foreigners, some 172,000 of whom were in its capital, Salala, that you can see marked on this map. And that's where I did most of my fieldwork. The FARD was better known in the 1960s and 1970s though, as the home of a revolutionary movement that opposed British imperial influence in the Gulf and the rule of the British-backed Sultan of Muscat. This movement changed names several times. In this presentation, I'm going to follow local practice in Dofar and refer to the front as Gubha in the local pronunciation. From 1968, under the name the Popular Front for the Liberation of the Occupied Arabian Gulf, this movement adopted a Marxist program for social change, development and gender equality. These are some pictures from a glossy brochure produced by the Front uh, during uh, that time towards uh, the mid 70s. Um, and these are pictures that speak to those projects of social change, classroom environments, uh, mixed genders. Um, you can see women also here bearing arms. So speaking to those projects of social emancipation. And if any of you want to follow up more on that, the film by the Lebanese director Hini Surur from 1974, the film is called The Hour of Liberation Has Struck, will show you more scenes of the kinds of projects for social change that the Front was pursuing. The Omani government and its allies, Britain, Jordan and Iran, fought a war against the Fars revolutionaries. After the 1970 coup, in which Britain deposed Sultan Said and installed his son Qaboos, who ruled until his death earlier this year in 2020, the Omani government and British military allies offered their own programme of social development to rival the Front's programme in the hope that this would help win over the Faris. The counterinsurgency invested in schools, roads, wells and other infrastructure as it took over areas of the Far from the revolutionaries. The government even ended up grading pocket money for children in the territories that it took over from insurgents. The more revolutionary the parents, the higher the government pocket money for the children. In other words, as the title of this book suggests, development, which I interpret here as a proxy for patronage, was a strategy to dispel the Fari opposition to the Sultan's rule. 
what the title of this book does not allude to are the parallel strategies of repression that the counterinsurgency also used against the Fares revolutionaries. The counterinsurgency forces operated a food blockade and aimed to starve and coerce the Faris into submission by bombing civilian and revolutionary agricultural resources and livestock, as British military records from the time uh, give details about. So in the Verfara War, just as we saw for the Arab Spring examples, both patronage as well as repression were strategies that pushed for the defeat of an opposition movement. To go back then to the question of what happens to revolutionary ideas and networks after military defeat, at least in the case of the Dofar War, dominant historical narratives that we find in conventional historiographical work focus on the apparent success of patronage in undoing revolution and cutting off legacies, values and networks of defeated revolution. And these narratives have typically downplayed the use of coercion. They've stressed the notion that the Faris quickly gave up on interest in a revolutionary socialist project because perhaps they were never interested it, it never truly interested in the first place. These kinds of dominant narratives neglect what the British historian E.P. Thompson called counter history. By counter history, he meant histories that recover the experiences of the marginalized. And these are the perspectives that have been excluded from official histories. In the Omani case, the official narrative that there was an overwhelming and complete government victory over the front. Indeed, there is no official public discussion in Oman about the history of the war. Even though the government could tell a narrative of how it won the war, in Oman, the very idea of opposition to the Sultan is so controversial that museums, history textbooks, etc., don't mention the armed opposition movements against the Sultan, either in Dofar or in other cases. Omanis who do publicly mention government violence during the Dofar war run the risk of punishment. When, in 2016, an Omani journalist, Abdel Habib, wrote on Facebook that the government of Oman should reveal the sites of graves of revolutionaries whom counterinsurgency forces, whom counterinsurgency forces executed in Dofar, he received a three-year jail sentence. He was later pardoned. This sensitivity around public discussion of the war constrained my fieldwork and the kinds of conversations and observations that were accessible or inaccessible for me. And it has constrained my choices about what to include and exclude in any publication. All the interlocutors with whom I spoke about these themes knew that I was a researcher wanting to understand and write about social change in post-war times in Dofar. And if people shared something with me and then added to me, don't write that, then I have excluded this material from publication. For any interlocutors speaking about sensitive issues with me um, that have ended up uh, in the publication, I anonymise them through changes in names and biographical details. So standing in contrast to the official silence in Oman about the war, my research contributes to a counter history of post-war Dofar and defeated revolutionaries. My project questions dominant narratives about Dofar in particular, that Dafaris soon lost interest in the revolutionary socialist project, and I question narratives about post-conflict authoritarian states more broadly, that patronage and repression successfully stamp out vestiges of political opposition. Recent years have been an exciting time to pursue such projects of counter-history in Gulf studies. There are growing counter-historical studies that analyze the Gulf from non-dominant perspectives. And on these slides, I just give a small hint of that, studies that look at the Gulf from the perspective of religious minorities, of non-dominant gendered subjects, of disgruntled youths, of everyday memory and piety, and from the perspective of the broad range of actors who have shaped cities as contested spaces beyond the official narratives of monarch-led modernization. Prominent in these revisionist studies is the move to recover histories of opposition political activists in the Gulf and situate them in global decolonization and leftist movements. A landmark study here is Abdul Razak Etakliti's Monsoon Revolution. This study foregrounds a revisionist history of the Dofar revolutionary period from 1965 up to 1976. Tukriti shows how the Fari revolutionaries 
took inspiration from Gulf and international anti-colonial nationalist and leftist movements, and also grew out of existing mobilization on the ground amongst the Faris, such as migration movements to the Gulf for work and education from the 1940s to the 1960s. My research takes up both the project to examine revolutionary experience in local, national and global contexts, and the project to bring to the fore counter-historical narratives by focusing on the FAR in the post-war period after 1975. Drawing on that first study I mentioned earlier in 2013, and then drawing on five months of fieldwork in 2015, my research uses ethnographic methods, such as observing and taking part in everyday activities with the Faris, such as daily social gatherings and attending kinship events, informal and everyday conversations and some formal interviews. And through these, I trace what I'm calling the social afterlives of revolution, manifest in ongoing legacies of revolutionary social values in the everyday lives of some, not all, but some the Faris. The notion of afterlives has been the subject of considerable scholarly discussion in recent years, and I'm happy to discuss that further in the Q&A. Afterlives can mean ongoing influence, later stage of, a later stage of life, life after death. So I'm interested in ongoing legacies and ongoing influence and presence of revolutionary networks and social values amongst the Faris. And I want to pluralize afterlives to highlight the heterogeneity of these afterlives for the Faris and the heterogeneity of former revolutionaries' divergent positionings within these afterlives. We already know from the historical sources that Tikriti examined and from eyewitness accounts from the time that when they were revolutionaries, there were very different histories and motivations that brought the Faris to the movement. Some had leftist interests, some nationalist interests, some were opposed to Sultan Said's taxes, and there's evidence of some women joining the revolution in ways that allowed them to evade the patriarchal authority of husbands and fathers, even though they then encountered other forms of authority, specifically revolutionary authority. In addition to all these different reasons for joining the revolution, my research with former revolutionaries and family members, and my interpretation of historical sources, both from the revolution and sources noted by counterinsurgency forces, so my interest in all of these highlights how former revolutionaries also had different trajectories away from the movement. Some, like Yusuf bin Alawi pictured here, left the front relatively early to support Qaboos and went on to have high profile political careers. In his case, rising to serve as minister responsible for foreign affairs. Others who stayed on with the front in exile in Southern Yemen until the early 1990s when the front ceased formal activities after the fall of socialism in Yemen, struggled to get a job once they were back in Oman. Pathways away from the revolution and the afterlives of revolution were also gendered. There were not the same opportunities available for men and women. So there's a great diversity of experiences, not only of revolution, but also of its afterlives. And I'll share a few brief examples now to illustrate the diversity of those afterlives. I found three areas of afterlives where some, and I stress some, not all, the Fadi former revolutionaries and some of their relatives reproduced legacies of defeated revolution through everyday interactions. And these fall into kinship practices, everyday socializing and unofficial commemoration. And these will be the three empirical chapters of my book. And you can find shorter versions of the discussions on kinship and everyday socializing in articles that came out uh, in the past couple of years. So I'll talk first about kinship. Kinship was already a focus of tension of, I'm sorry. Kinship was already a focus of attention during the revolution. In this revolutionary movement, as in others, kinship, by which I mean the ways in which people understand themselves to be related to one another, had been one of the ways in which the movement itself tried to forge new social relations. 
For instance, the front encouraged marriages that contravened traditional social hierarchies. So in this context, that could mean encouraging marriages between a woman of higher ranking status uh, than, than her husband, um, than a husband of lower ranking status. That might be, for instance, a woman de tracing descent from the Prophet Muhammad, a, a Serda woman, marrying, marrying any man of non Serda status. Or it could mean a woman of historically free status marrying a man of historically enslaved status. And I'll just point out here that until the revolution abolished slavery in 1968, slavery was still an active category in, in Dofar. And indeed, Sultan Saeed owned significant numbers of slaves there. And I encountered examples of those kinds of marriage, uh, marriages amongst uh, former revolu rev revolutionaries. So that's just one example of um, how the revolution was trying to change kinship. There are many other examples. I'd be happy to open up in the Q&A. But I want to just move on now uh, to briefly acknowledge the ways that kinship remained important in the post-war context. There were several ways in which former, some former revolutionaries used kinship to maintain networks and to re produce revolutionary social values, such as that social egalitarianism, the idea that people could marry contravening traditional social hierarchies. Some former revolutionaries maintained those, if you like, socially odd marriages that had happened during the revolution. They maintained them into the post-revolutionary period. And these marriages stood out to other Bafaris. They could spot them in places like hospital wards during hospital visits, where they could see the different kind of makeup of a family, or they could spot the child of one of these marriages because of the accent that they spoke with. Or they could spot somebody voting in a place that they didn't expect that they would vote from because of the nature of the, if you like, mixed up nature of their, their parents' backgrounds. There were other uh, ways that um, kinship became a way for former revolutionaries to acknowledge uh, revolutionary networks and continue to maintain them. For instance, there were former revolutionaries who named children born after the end of the war, after revolutionary figures. And there was also a distinctive social inclusiveness in the profile of former revolutionaries who attended kinship events amongst those families, such as weddings and funerals. This diversity of backgrounds at those kinship events amongst attendees transgressed those everyday hierarchies in Dofar and transgressed them in ways that spoke to hierarchies of tribe, of status group, and uh, on some occasions, gender. So in those instances that I've discussed, there was a degree of intention where former revolutionaries were using an aspect of kinship to make connections with other revolutionaries or hark back to revolutionary inclusiveness of, of, of social backgrounds. But I also point out that there were cases where there were more distant relatives who weren't directly closely related to a former revolutionary, but because they had a distant relative in the revolution, ended up making an unusual kind of um, contact and ended up in also unusually uh, unusual marriages. So there were marriages for, that happened in the post-war period that weren't themselves the children of former revolutionaries, but they had an unusual social, social profile that could be traced back uh, to um, the fact that somebody back in the family lines had been in the revolution. So there were also um, afterlives of revolutionary kinship that weren't direct intentional products of revolution, former revolutionaries. So I'll speak briefly to everyday socialising now. And here I want to show you a picture of what we would be doing right now if we were mature adult men in Salala this evening. We would be sitting with a group of our close friends in a, well, perhaps not in coronavirus times, I have to admit, uh, but um, outside that context, we would be sitting with our regular group of friends enjoying the cool evening. These are two groups that I um, was in honorary and odd interloper member of uh, during my time in the field. So these are male only groups. And the distinctive thing for the vast majority of these groups is that people meet in a friendship group that is based on a shared social background. So elites meet with elites and non-elites meet with non-elites. And the only group that I met where that was not the case, where the friends meeting came from all kinds of different social backgrounds from across the spectrum of the most elite to historically the least elite was a group of former revolutionaries. They were not only socially inclusive in their backgrounds, they were distinctive in their more egalitarian approach to what they actually did in those gatherings. For instance, in the kind of gatherings that you see here, 
I learned that there was usually a richer person who was the regular patron figure who would buy takeaway meals and feed the group um, you know, every now and then. And the former revolutionaries had a rota for that where they took it in turns. So they spread uh, that um, they didn't have a patron figure. They had a much more egalitarian approach. And then thirdly, I'll briefly address this idea of unofficial commemoration. It's clear from the case of Abdullah Habib, whom I mentioned earlier, that there was no public commemoration of the revolution in Oman. There are no street names, no monuments, no statues that refer to the revolution. There is a very strong public culture of memorialization in Oman, but it focuses on Sultan Qaboos and the national narrative of his renaissance, Nehda as it's called, so the idea that he personally brought a program of modernization and progress and development to Oman. But what I found is that some former revolutionaries found other means of doing what I'm calling unofficial commemoration for the revolution. So I'll just give one example of that. When people returned from exile, for instance, in southern Yemen, and some of those returns were happening as late as 2014, so this has been a very long drawn out process, but most of them happened in the 70s, 80s and 90s. When people came back, for some of these people, often people who'd had a prominent role in the revolution, their friends and relatives would hold a celebration to welcome them back. And um, these are quite, I would argue, uh, interesting and maybe ambiguous events in that there's the possibility of seeing this as a celebration of a perhaps prodigal person returning, having returned to the fold, but also the possibility of an interpretation of celebrating the return of somebody because they were important in that project for the revolution. And indeed, I point out here that many of the Fadis hold the view that they actually won the war because they take the view that the Fadis managed to persuade um, uh, Britain that it became urgent to depose Said and to have a change of government and then to persuade the new government to change its policies and bring a program of education and development. So um, there's a very different account of who won the war amongst many of the Fadis. What I want to stress from these informal practices of kinship everyday socialising and unofficial commemoration is that they preserve networks amongst former revolutionaries and they make these networks visible sometimes to other the Fadis but especially to other former revolutionaries for instance who know the names and know what to look out for for the names given to new generations of children. These practices pass on knowledge to a new generation and they also are distinctive in their social inclusiveness and I really want to stress that um, I think it's key to this reproduction of a revolutionary notion of a social value of valuing social egalitarianism and that is a contrast to the dominant social hierarchies and distinctions that you find in the far along lines of gender tribal uh, gender tribe status group and to an extent racialized categories so these practices are reproducing a more socially inclusive and i think in that sense counter hegemonic social order but these practices were a contested and sensitive field. Not everyone pursued these possibilities or connections. Indeed, some rev former revolutionaries avoided the places where they were likely to meet certain other former revolutionaries. Also, any possibility for making connections was not equally available to all former revolutionaries. Women in the far do not sit around with female friendship groups in cafes in the evening. Women's social networks are usually much more focused on relatives. And in fact, women former revolutionaries often used everyday practices such as piety to claim belonging and conformity rather than a sense of distinctiveness. Some of the former revolutionary women, especially those who had been educated abroad in countries friendly to the revolution, Cuba, Iraq, Syria, some of these women when they returned had very high levels of educational capital that was valued by uh, the Omani government and they went on to have significant professional careers, for instance in teaching, banking, medicine. And this was at a time in the late 70s, 1980s and even into the 1990s when many families in the Far who did not have a revolutionary background disapproved of women hailing of, of women who hailed from a historically free background working for a wage outside the home. So for instance, I know of one case from the 1980s when a group of male relatives got together and said to a woman who um, uh, 
uh, you know, had a, a family background in the revolution and, and, and was working outside the home, said to her, or rather said to her husband, please ask her to stay at home and we will pay her salary. So you know, it was really quite um, uh, unusual and uh, behavior that transgressed social norms for women to be working outside the home, women of certain backgrounds to be working outside the home in those early decades of, of the post-war years. And so what I observed and heard about from other the Faris is that many former revolutionary women were meticulously pious and they used piety as a way to claim social legitimacy, even as they transgressed those older norms about certain women working outside the home. So there are certain caveats to bear in mind, but I did find a pattern that some former revolutionaries sought out connections when on with one another. They hung around in places they were likely to meet each other. They looked out in public for clues of children of revolutionary marriages. And the fact that veterans of the front valued these connections and valued social inclusiveness was recognizable as distinctive to other the Faris. For instance, one person who did not have a background in the revolution commented to me, their culture is different. I've given you the briefest glimpse of some of these social afterlives of revolution. Let me suggest some of the ways in which these afterlives matter, and then I will offer some brief conclusions. So I think that these social afterlives of revolution matter for debates about how we understand revolution, patronage, and everyday life in post-conflict scenarios. Turning first to revolution, Social scientists and historians have traced how revolutions transform social life during transient times of protest, such as during spaces like Tahrir Square. And we also have, you know, for instance, wonderful studies of the anti-Shah uprisings in Iran in 1979. So we've got studies of those transient moments. We also have a body of studies addressing the impacts of revolutionary government over time on civilian populations. Suzanne Dow Green's work on Southern Yemen, Natalia Vince's work on gendered experiences of revolution in Algeria, and my own work in my first project on the building of revolutionary governance and state power amongst refugees from Western Sahara. But we know a lot less about the legacies of defeated revolution when ex-militants live under the authoritarian rule of the regimes they once opposed and that now marginalize and repress them. So in this research project, I shed light on these questions by probing social afterlives of revolution. And I think this can push us in novel directions for thinking about revolutions in the Middle East and indeed beyond we can really push to expose the blurred boundaries between notions of supposedly successful and failed revolutions. If former revolutionaries continue to reproduce social values that they once reproduced through the revolution, values that remain distinctive, that is to say they have not become normal or dominant in the post-revolutionary context, then we have to rethink the notion of when, when a revolution has ceased or indeed failed. In fact, my research shows how revolutionary projects might live on in alternative spheres, such as intimate relationships of kinship and everyday socializing. Looking at social afterlives of defeated revolution also forges an agenda for questions we must ask in coming years about recent Arab Spring revolutions. With the Fari ex-revolutionaries in mind, we can inquire about the horizons of how post-Arab Spring generations of disappointed and repressed revolutionaries may preserve and reproduce legacies of their own revolutionary past and values and aspirations. And thirdly, recognizing these social afterlives of defeated revolution is key for understanding how appetites for progressive politics might resurface over time after defeated revolution. And such appetites did reemerge in Dhofar. The Fari staged the longest lasting of Oman's Arab Spring protests in 2011, and I'll return to them shortly in the conclusion. So those are some of the ways in which I think afterlives of revolution open up new questions in thinking about revolution. Turning to patronage, many of you will be familiar from the media or from political science debates with the idea that patronage or clientelism, as it's often called, is an apparent pathology um, often linked to corruption. So the Gulf monarchies don't really fit that kind of uh, approach to 
patronage or clientelism as pathology because in local terms in the Gulf patronage so the rule of giving out material resources to shore up political loyalty is not a pathology it's actually the way that people expect that uh, the ruler will behave and that's how people expect to have the favor of the ruler uh, recognized and as I discussed earlier, the FAR is conventionally seen as a so-called model counterinsurgency campaign because of the government's multiple water, wartime and post-war civilian development programmes. And handouts to the FARIs were still in use 40 years after the end of the war. And I want to stress that these kinds of handout, handouts reinforce hierarchical relations and respective positions of hierarchy between the Sultan as patron and the FARIs as subordinate protégés. So here I want to stress that patronage inherently reproduces hierarchical relations. Yet by elucidating the ways that the Fadi ex-revolutionaries reproduce revolutionary social networks and values of social egalitarianism, my research suggests how recipients of patronage, though embedded in underpinning hierarchical relations, and I stress former revolutionaries were embedded in those patronage relations, they were on smaller or larger amounts of some kind of handout from the government, so people can be embedded in those relations, but can still find ways of reproducing alternative, more egalitarian social relations in their intimate lives. And these more egalitarian relations challenge the hierarchical implications of patronage. By turning to the social afterlives of revolution, then, we can shed light on the limitations and countercurrents within patronage relations. And we can see more about the ways in which subjects of patronage can reproduce more egalitarian relations that challenge the hierarchical premises of patronage. And the third area of wide implications that I want to comment on today concerns what kinds of social relations, the post-conflict everyday ordinary interactions, such as kinship and everyday socialising, what kind of social relations do they reproduce? Scholars of post-conflict settings have noted how Kinship and everyday socialising can become resources for those who have lived through the devastation of conflict to re-establish and reclaim a sense of normal life after war and atrocities. Anthropologist Veena Das, studying the survivors of communal violence in India, found that people tried to overcome that by what she calls a descent into the ordinary. And her findings are further reflected in the desire of Palestinians and Lebanese and others to recreate normal life in the wake of concept, conflict through kinship and everyday social activities, as research by Toby Kelly and Sami Hermes, for instance, has shown. My project, however, disrupts the association of the everyday with the reproduction or the resumption of prevailing norms and trying to get back to, if you like, a, a normality that, the, that conflict disturbed. Instead, the case of the Fari ex-revolutionaries shows how the everyday in a post-conflict setting can reproduce counter-hegemonic social relations and values. And instead of offering a way of reclaiming distance from the trauma of conflict, the everyday can, in this kind of setting, provide a means of maintaining legacies of social relations and values that came to the fore during the fragile period of the conflict, in this case, the revolution. So I will conclude briefly. From small practices, such as maintaining revolutionary family units that became unusual in the post-revolutionary world, attending socially inclusive weddings and socially inclusive daily social gatherings, and attending unofficial commemoration events, from these kinds of small practices spring large implications. To go back to the question with which I opened of what happens to defeated revolutionaries living under a, a repressive political authority that marginalizes that history. Despite such inauspicious circumstances, the Lafari case shows that revolutionary social legacies can continue in personal intimate spheres. There are indeed social afterlives of revolution and these take divergent forms. Conventional narratives that the Fadis were never really interested in a social revolutionary socialist revolutionary project are not borne out for the families that I observed and some of their relatives. Their attachment to revolutionary social values of social egalitarianism then was not superficial and some continued to reproduce social networks and values that reflected those um, that social egalitarianism into the post-revolutionary and post-war period. <laughs>
I've suggested that these social afterlives of revolution matter for understanding revolution as an open-ended set of social processes, for understanding the limitations and countercurrents within patronage relations, and for understanding the potential of everyday interactions in post-conflict settings for reproducing counter-hegemonic social values that emerged in the fragile context of wartime disruption, in this case, revolution. But what do these social afterlives of revolution mean in the local social contexts? Are the social afterlives of revolution a form of resistance, social resistance, political resistance? I suggest that the relationship of afterlives of revolution to resistance is complex. This is an extremely important, important question, especially as concerns, most especially as, as concerns the safety of my interlocutors. So uh, I really want to um, stress that it's not my argument that the forms of uh, social afterlives of revolution that I've described, like kinship and everyday socializing and unofficial commemoration, I do not see these as forms of resistance that are con of concern to the Omani government. We know from the Abdullah Habib example that the Omani government does police the way that people talk about and think about and remember the war and when people have crossed a red line then it can follow that they get punished. So I think that the fact that all the things I've talked about are happening, known about and they're part of what the Fadis know about in public indicates that there is no resistance here of concern to the Omani government. I think if there had been then these things wouldn't have been happening openly in public. As the Arab Spring showed us, there is, for some Omanis, a yearning for political and economic reform in Oman. This brings us back to the broad meanings of afterlives as continued influence and a later stage of life. We do see continued influence and a later stage of life for the Fars revolution. I've argued on the one hand for later stages in terms of kinship, daily socialising and unofficial commemoration. But different kinds of afterlives also emerged in Salala's Arab Spring protests that took place from February to May in 2011. Again, I note that these were the longest lasting of the Arab Spring protests in Oman. This is a picture of these protests during their peak in March 2011. And this second picture gives an indication of how the protests ended. And you might be able to make out tanks in the background there. During the Arab Spring protests in Salala, some of the Fadis chanted, the one who forgets the 1970s should think of the grandchildren of the free men. This chant refers back to the war, the 1970s, and it situates the protesters in a genealogy of free men. This suggests how there is a continued influence and a later stage of life for the Fars revolution that takes on a scale beyond former revolutionaries and their family members. The revolution can appear as a source of inspiration for voicing future claims for future generations. Asif Bayat has pointed out that it might be in 10 or 20 years time that we see the results of the revolutions in Egypt and Tunisia. I think the Fars suggest to us that we can still find afterlives of revolution after much longer. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, Alice, uh, for this, um, this great talk.